And I'm delighted to be joined now by the QC, Chris Dorr, uh, who has, has written on this subject and studied this subject uh, intensely. Chris, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, I'm sorry you missed the trifle, but there we are. Um, uh, Rich, I was thinking about your trifle. You know, that's exactly the sort of food that someone who'd been smoking a bit of weed might fancy in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> <They don't smoke. laughs> um, indeed. So, look, um, uh, I'm not a fan of Sadiq Khan, and uh, from the right-wing press, he has had a massive amount of uh, grief uh, for, essentially, for being in California to, to, to go on a fact-finding uh, mission to learn about this. Um, what are your thoughts about his visit and about the commission that he's setting up uh, and the timeliness of it? Well, I think it's it's long overdue that we in this country started to look at the drug laws that came into force really in the early 1970s and which are completely unfit for purpose. I mean, they were driven entirely by Richard Nixon, um, you know, who had a very strong view about these things. Um, but in terms of um, Sadiq Khan, I mean, the problem we have is that we have a system of parliamentary government as you know and the mayor of london has really no power to do anything he, he can certainly publicize the issue um, and he can certainly um you know um, pre present evidence to the home office but ultimately uh, the decision uh, on these laws has to be made by the home secretary and the prime minister and the government of the day and and uh, you know the interesting thing about london of course anyone who spends any time wandering around the streets of london is that you know, on a street level, cannabis is extremely common. I mean, you know, it's a smell that you you know you can pick up on most uh, busy London streets, particularly you know in the evenings and when young people are out and about. And the police tend to take little or no action in response to low levels, you know, um, use by individuals. Um, but really, we need to have a grown-up, joined-up policy decision, as you indicated earlier, based on evidence rather than just ad hoc kind of lack of enforcement because maybe it's easier not to enforce, you know, and, and people don't know where they stand. And I just think we need some clarity around it. So frankly, if Sadiq Khan could bring attention to the ridiculous uh, drug laws that we have in this country, and we can start a debate about it, then that's got to be a good thing. I, I think that's right. And actually, he is in, uh, he, obviously, he's not in a position, as you rightly say, to, in a sense, to change the law. But he is in a very powerful position to to encourage the debate, to properly analyse the evidence, scientific, anecdotal, to look at, at what's gone on in other countries where uh, they're doing things differently. And then essentially his commission, and I don't know how long that's going to sit, um, can then make recommendations and we can have that grown up debate about it. Because of course, it's in a sense, it's so different, isn't it, Chris, in, in cities, as opposed to, uh, you know, people out in the countryside uh, with very different views on it. Yeah, and I, I don't, I'm not sure that, that views vary that much between uh, rural and uh, urban areas. I think views may differ between age groups. Um, certainly, I think younger people are much more tolerant and much more accepting of the idea of legalised uh, cannabis and indeed uh, other drugs being legalised than than older generations. But it's all that's always, in a sense, been the case. I mean, the irony, of course, is that you have you know the the, the old bloke at the bar in the pub sipping beer and whiskey and and telling everyone why drugs should be um, so such a bad crime. You know, it's, you know when when I think anybody who's studied the evidence knows that alcohol is by far the most dangerous and pernicious drugs, except possibly nicotine, um, uh, attached to tobacco use, both of which are massive killers in our country. So of course, there's that irony, isn't there, around what's legal and what isn't? Um, but I think you're absolutely right. I think um, I think Sadiq Khan's quite a brave politician. It may be because he has the support of uh, of, of Londoners in, in large numbers uh, and feels confident in this position, but most national politicians just don't have the courage to speak out and say, actually, maybe we should look at um, a, a legalisation model of some kind in relation to cannabis and possibly other drugs. Um, I think it's a good thing that a politician that's very high profile is actually um, at least saying, maybe we can do things differently. I think that's right. As I say, I am no fan of Sadiq Khan, but I do think that he is bravely trying to assess some evidence and learn from it. <clears throat> and it may, what we do know is that knife crime is soaring in London. We know that, uh, you know, tragically, murders and violent crime is on the up. Much of it is linked to the drugs trade. And, and we have to surely say, at some point, we've got to try something different, even if it's only on an experimental basis in, an ex in, a, in a particular area, to see what we learn from it. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the reason why drugs lead to so much uh, ancillary crime of the kind you've described, in particular violence um, against and between young people on the streets, um, is because it's illegal and because it therefore creates this market, this black market, which is extremely uh, vulnerable to um, the, or- the involvement of organised crime. Uh, and indeed, most drug supply, if not it, almost all drug supply in Britain, comes by, by organised crime networks. Um, and those networks are, are you know, completely unregulated, uh, have no regards for law, and in many cases, no regard for human life. But we've created that market. We created that market back in the early 1970s when we brought in the Misuse of Drugs Act. And I think one of the statistics that may, may shock people the most is that when the Misuse of Drugs Act came into force in the early 1970s, we only had about 1,000 people who were what you might call heroin addicts or had a, had a problem with heroin. And they got their heroin from doctors and they were prescribed the heroin and, and you know the heroin was of a known quantity and so on. Within a decade, within a decade, we had 300,000 heroin addicts all buying their heroin from the black market. Do you know, Chris, what's that number now who are essentially addicted to heroin? Across the country, it's it's well into the hundreds of thousands in excess of 300,000 today. Um, And as I say, and you also had the advent in the 1980s of the crack cocaine explosion, which is still a major problem in cities. Um, but even cannabis, which, you know, most people would say, OK, well, I don't agree with heroin and cocaine being legalised, but, you know, cannabis, it seems like, like maybe that's the argument. The problem with just legalising cannabis is that you would leave the, the gangs in control of the supply chain. And indeed, it'd be even more of a free fall well, in the Wild West than we have now. So, so you know, it's not just about saying, OK, let people no, do whatever they want. You know, it's about licensing and regulating the supply chain. Well, that's the, that's, that that's the evidence, in a sense, that's needed to look at the licensing and regulating that other countries and states use. Chris, um, we're going to come back and talk about this issue. It's such an important issue. Thank you so much, Chris Daw QC, for his thoughts on uh, the issue of uh, legalising uh, cannabis. Uh, I'm going to be taking your calls after the break. You're listening to Ty's Talk here on Talk TV.